And so the tree witnessed all of that. And the tree remains and that like you can feel it and the depth of time and what healing looks like and what growth looks like. We're treating the world to come, spiraling in time, dreaming alive, dreaming alive, dreaming the world to come, dreaming alive, dreaming alive, dreaming alive. can we hear our song? Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm Nomi. And this is dreaming the world to come. <laughs> this is dreaming the world to come, a project where we reimagine time and the ways we relate to it, aligning with ancestral Jewish traditions and honoring the diverse voices and experiences of the diaspora, past, present, and future, and the magnificent humans who have been dreaming of a just world for millennia. Rebecca and I are both queer, non-binary, white, disabled Jews, and Hebrew priestesses or priestesses, and we live in the Pacific Northwest on Squaxin land, also known as the Stechos Village, known colonially as Olympia, Washington. In addition to this podcast, we create a planner that combines Hebrew, Gregorian, and moon calendars. This year is called Indwelling Dreams of Olam Haba. The podcast will be coming out at the beginning of each Hebrew month and will include our takes on that month and an interview with a contributor who wrote about the month in the planner. And we are transitioning out of our work with the planner and are going to continue the podcast. So we hope you'll continue to listen and follow along with the journey, which will be completely relevant whether you have the planner or not. And you don't need the planner to enjoy the podcast, but you can still buy it at dreamingtheworldtocome.com. It's currently on sale for $18 while supplies last, which is <laughs> less than half the original price. Don't let these trees' lives be in vain. In honor of Tubishvat, of the tree ancestors and family members, um, buy our planner. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you want planners for a raffle, or if you can think of other good ways to use these planners, we still have a lot of them, and it's still early enough in the year that they could be pretty useful. So let us know. Send us an email at elementalactivation at gmail.com. And then we also have a Patreon which is a wonderful way to support our work, help make sure that the contributors get paid, that the editors and ASL and everyone that is working on the project, hopefully ourselves as well someday, could be paid for this work. You can join for as little as a dollar a month. Go to patreon.com slash dreaming the world to come. Beep boop. Beep boop. So this is the month of Shvat. And I'm wondering, Rebecca, what are your associations with Shvat? Well, it's the New Year of Trees, Tuba Shvat, the holiday where we celebrate all the fruits and nuts of trees and where we kind of get back to our deep roots in terms of like feminist, earth-based reclaiming practices, one of our prime places to tap into all of that. Mm -hmm. So before rabbinical Judaism, Judaism was more of a ritual practice with pagan practices. And one of the primary connections that we have that we know about from that is the Asherah pole. Mm -hmm. And so this either tree, sacred tree, or actual literal pole that polytheistic religions or cultic practices revolved around embraced the tree of life we often mm -hmm. hear about the kabbalistic tree of of life where the, the sefirot the emanations the divine emanations of god but also yeah. the torah being called the tree of life right. yeah yeah so i mean i guess in terms of this time of year I love the associations with those ancient practices, but mm. it's also a time where the trees are resting in our world. I was in the woods today and really noticing 
there's these areas where it's all alder trees mm -hmm. and then a, a stand of maples and a grove of cedars and just kind of feeling, wow, each of these like places where the trees gather together. There's Of course, there's other trees mixed in with them all, but Mm -hmm. They all have such different feelings to yeah. them and different mushrooms growing on different downed trees mm -hmm. that like even the mushrooms have preferences for different relationships and yeah, really appreciating trees. We yeah. live in a place where we get to be with the green of the trees a lot of the year because we have so many evergreens, yeah. and moss and lichens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so wet in the winter that it's like super green up here all year round. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting because I think in, I don't know where, I'm not good at like citing <laughs> Torah portions and Talmud, but I have been educated to know that historically Tu Bishvat was a time when it was, con it was like the birthday of trees, but not so much in a spiritual way, but more in a like, accounting way like you count the trees at this time to know how much you're gonna tithe to the community to the temple i think oh to the temple yeah so it's like kind of like tax day or something i'm curious what you might have learned growing up about to bishvat like i think we would like sing a song about trees and like mm. uh, oh plant trees and then there's the whole like plant a tree in israel thing that would often <laughs> be associated with Tubishvat, which we've talked a little bit about in our kislev episode but just like that sadly misguided colonizing project of planting trees in israel but i remember as a kid at like sunday school and stuff that we would like go outside and plant a tree on Tubishvat sometimes and yeah. Did you grow up practicing Tubishvat at all? I don't remember practicing Tubishvat. Um, the first time I remember practicing Tubishvat was like my first or second year out here. Mm. And we did a Tubishvat Seder. And I mean, I remember it really vividly because it was one of my first adult experiences of Judaism mm. where I felt so engaged and enlivened by the ritual and we ate all the different fruits and nuts. I remember we all went out into the street after mm. the Seder and danced and sang really loud in the streets. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is the kind of Judaism I want to be a part of. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Will you share a little more about the Tubishvat Seder? Because that's more of like a Kabbalist invention, right? Yeah, my understanding has been that, yeah, the Kabbalists embraced and revisioned the tithing holiday to be a mystical holiday to mm -hmm. celebrate the trees and our relationship with growing things as humans and taking us through the worlds, the elemental worlds of earth, air, fire, and water, and using each of the fruits or nuts depending on what they are to associate them with the different worlds. Mm. And I remember that it has to do with like, okay, here's something that has like a hard outside and a soft inside. And that has a metaphorical relationship to ourselves and our spirits and our bodies. And then something that has like a soft outside, but a hard pit. And that has a different metaphysical meaning. I can't remember any of the specifics in this moment. Do you remember? Yeah, I am pulling up my document about it right now. Okay, here we go. So the first world is Asiya, the world of action. And our kavana or intention for the first world is grounded in the earth in right action. Mm -hmm. And the season is winter. So the symbolic foods are fruits with husks who mm. have an inedible outside and edible inside. So like orange, banana, almond, pomegranate, walnut, coconut, hazelnut, or pecan. And then the part of the body you're connecting with in that world is your physical body. Mm. And the second world is Yetzira. The world of formation. So it is about creative flow and growth. And the element is water. It's connected with a spring. And in this world, you're eating fruit with pits. So edible on the outside, inedible on the inside, dates, olives, apricots, plums, and peaches. 
And the third world is Bria, the world of thought, taking deep breaths and mindfulness. The <laughs> element is air. The season is summer. And the foods are soft fruits that are entirely edible. Blueberry, strawberry, raspberry. And then the fourth world is Atsilut, the world of spirit. So being with the mystery and oneness and the element is fire the season is fall and there's there's no food it's only scents oh and, interesting yeah so you're connecting with your spiritual self do you have a sense of why the pits where the pit or what the inedible part how that relates to the element or to ourselves or hmm well, I kind of think of like the first world, the world of Asia, the world of action being the fruit with husks is mm -hmm. like you have to work at it the most. So you have to take mm -hmm. action to get to the inside, mm -hmm. like peeling a banana or breaking mm -hmm. the nut open, the husk of the almond or walnuts or, you know, other nuts. Working also to get the say, seeds of the pomegranate out, you know. Yeah, yeah. And when you say husks, that makes me think of klipot, like the the husk literally is the word that gets used that is like surrounding the spark of divinity. Mm. Um and that we have to kind of like peel back the husk Ooh. The to reveal that inner spark and that light. Yeah. So let's see, second world, Yetzira, world of formation. So that's fruit with pits, edible outside, inedible inside, and water, connected with water and spring. Well, definitely a lot of those fruits, when you eat them, they're like gushing over your face and like a peach, like, oh, that's so like juicy, watery. Mm hmm. Yeah. When I thought about this before, I've thought about the sensation of biting down on a hard pit mm -hmm. and wondered how that is related because Yetzira is the world of emotions. Mm -hmm. So having such a varied experience through the physical act of eating these things of mm -hmm. like, you're like, oh, it's so gushy or delicious mm -hmm. at first and having like this pleasurable moment. But also, I don't know if you've ever been down on an olive pit mm -hmm. or a date pit. It's so hard and sometimes it hurts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of jarring. Mm -hmm. Or if you're having a really emotional experience and then you hit like some kind of hard truth or... Mm. Um, you know reality that kind of can't get moved to suit the emotion yeah. yeah and then bria world of thought air summer and that's entirely edible oh entirely like, edible like, like small what? seeds raspberries berries oh, uh -huh, berries it does feel very summer <laughs> i really love how the fourth world Atsilu, is connected with spiritual like emanation emanation and just sense Mm -hmm. smells yeah i feel like fragrance or scent is emanation you know mm -hmm. yeah that's really cool yeah thank you for sharing this yeah and then the other tree that's really associated with shvat is the almond tree the almond is the first to flower and last to fruit which is so poetic and yeah. gives us hope in the middle of winter with her mm -hmm. flower reminding us fruits are coming we planted two almond trees this year. And when we were getting the trees at the Eastside Farm and Garden store, Lisa was like, well, and this is a Jewish practice. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, oh, well, kind of. Yes, I've talked about it in a Jewish way. Yes, yes. I'm excited to see the reality because I've learned from you and from Yah that it's the first to flower and the last to fruit and I'm excited to have that experience because I don't think I've ever been around almond trees before. I'm curious about almond tree, about the Asherah pole, because there's the story in the Torah of Aaron's staff blooming into an almond. Oh, yeah, flowering, La almond. flowering almond. And then also the first menorot, the menorahs from in the ancient temple were mm -hmm. made in the shape of almond branches or made with almond branches. And mm -hmm. that there were seven, you know, the Hanukkah 
menorah has eight nine. places or nine with the shamash but the original from the temple pre-hanukkah mm. have seven for the days of the mm. week and i always remember um rabbi lynn being like seven like when you go like this your head and then your hands this oh, won't translate love... for audio but it's so, like if you put your two hands up with the priestess hands which is or... the spock symbol Mm -hmm. yep the live long and prosper spot hands um and do that on either side of your head and then with your head in the middle that's seven. Oh, i love that <laughs> so that's cool because aaron was the first the first priest, priest and that was his symbol the priestly symbol blessing uh, so, so they're probably all connected yeah rabbi lynn gottlieb was the one who oh, nice. shared that yeah ah. yeah but i'm thinking like that that veneration of almond i mean it's in the beginning of the torah so that probably was a connection to the asherah pole which yeah. was ancient people canaanite Pretty israelite, Pretty yeah. israelite one thing we were talking about right before we started recording was just so the israelites you know are like the ancestors of Jewish people who we track our lineages back to before the temple was put in place and this was like kind of consolidated a patriarchal religious and social system that before that there were these practices of honoring the divine feminine of you know what we call polytheism um or it's like currently called that but feels also like it's just connecting to source through the means that are available like trees of course we feel connected to source through trees and that that is like direct earthly connection to the temple of our bodies and the sky mm -hmm. and the earth mm -hmm. and and so it's just interesting because we trace ourselves back to these these texts which do feel very special to me but also those texts were used to kind of squash out this other type of worship and reverence that i feel really aligned with and yeah and some of them we will never find but some of them we know through our own bodies and our own experiences that we feel you know i can't recite eight generations of my ancestors but i have a felt sense of being from people from many, many generations back. Lighting the Shabbat candles is just something people have been doing for thousands of years. Yeah. yeah. And trees are the always been around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so cool that the Kabbalists, you know, in reinvented Tu Bishvat to be yeah. a holiday connected with the mystical, mm -hmm. which does connect us with the Asherah pole, with mm -hmm. worshiping our bodies and trees as connections between heaven and earth mm -hmm. and like energy translators and transformers and mm -hmm. collaborators. Yeah. And community builders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and rememberers of lineages and mm -hmm. all these things that are like scientifically being proven now or discovered, but that are like have been happening forever. Yeah, forests are whole societies. Yeah, and then there's this part about mycelium and mushrooms, mm -hmm. and that mycelium goes up into the clouds and is part mm -hmm. of what makes it rain. Isn't that amazing? And you know, they knew that you had to pray for rain mm -hmm. to have your crops grow, but you got to wonder about their connection with mycelium and fungus and some kind of knowing about the mystical connection with rain and the reverence yeah. for trees with that too. Amazing. She is a tree of life to those who hold fast to her and all her supporters are happy. Shalom, shalom. <laughs> yeah i do want to say before we go that the interview with socket was really sweet and we had tons of technical difficulties more than mm -hmm. we've ever had so we really did our best but i think especially with the video you might notice some weirdness go hug a tree love the trees Hi! I'm so happy to see you both. This 
is so awesome. It's been so long since I've seen your face. <laughs> what a joy. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great. We were both really, we've been talking about this. We're like, we can't wait to interview Socket. Oh. <laughs> In part because we just miss you and want to yeah. talk to you. <laughs> yeah, it's so mutual. I'm so happy that we're doing this. Well, we're going to start. I'm going to read your bio and then we'll get into the interview. Socket Klatsker is a community organizer, trauma therapist, conflict mediator, and workshop facilitator, as well as a fat, queer, disabled ritualist who approaches healing with a focus on refuach ha-nefesh, the healing of the soul from trauma, grief, conflict, and oppression. They work with various communities that experience trauma as a result of oppression. Socket is passionate about healing with nature, community, and collective liberation. Socket lives with beloved community in rural Tennessee. Welcome, Socket. Welcome, Socket. Wow, thank you. We love your piece for Shabbat so much. And I'm wondering what you would like to share with folks about your piece or about the process of writing the piece or about Shvat in general? You know, I feel like my challenge was to remember the gifts of being mid hibernation before I was in mid hibernation to talk about time travel. Like what is it like to be in the middle of going under, Mm -hmm. you know? So I was really challenged, but also grateful to invoke that feeling. And then just the prompts of working with the tarot archetypes. I'm obsessed with the star archetype. It's my favorite card in the whole deck. Me and too. I, really? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised that we have the favorite card. It's the same. But part of the reasons why I love it is because it's about letting yourself shine and being big and bright in being held in a constellation of other stars. Thinking about that in terms of Shvat and the context of the entire year and that it's its own star, its own brightness, and that kind of stillness and that kind of expectation of what's to come. This piece that jumped out to me is the anticipation of the bright green leaves is precious, tentative, It is almost audacious to imagine their forthcoming brightness and that audacity of remembering what spring feels like when you're in the middle of being bare, but know that something is coming Mm. that is shining. That is brightness. Yeah. And the connection between earth and sky and that Shabbat's this time of the trees. So the stars kind of like making their way Mm -hmm. through the tree tips. And in terms of like trees connecting the above with the below, you know, that when your roots are really deeply connected and then your branches are really up in the canopy, that is what embodied healing is Mm. when you can actually connect the above with the below. You, You can be grounded and you can also rise. I wish that I would have added something to my writing. I realized that I really wanted to talk about Palestine. And I was like a missed opportunity almost, but like that connection between olive tree harvests and what happens when trees are taken down in Palestine. I have connections to communities in the South Hebron Hills in the West Bank. And I, you know, being part of the olive harvest is something that I really am looking forward to doing next fall. And I just think a lot about that connection with the tree and what justice is ripe to pursue literally with trees, literally on that land, literally about life growing. It's so cool that you're going to be there for the olive harvest next year. That's the hope. We'll see. Life is weird, (laughs) but that's the hope. And yeah, I'm very excited to learn from the Palestinian partners that I've met there to just participate in that moment. Is there anything else related to Shvat or Tu B'Shvat that wants to be highlighted? Here? I mean, just in terms of Tu B'Shvat, I love how weird and pagan it is a holiday in <laughs> Judaism and how we just get to go and celebrate trees. Even the more traditional Jewish things are like you're eating each part of the tree and you're drinking different kinds of wine and you're doing this like total sensory amazing experience that is just so outside of 
stuffiness, you know. My favorite memories of Tubishvat were when I was living in Olympia and just going out to the woods and singing with the trees and seeing what comes through from them and not having a plan and they always had something to say. Yeah, it's funny because it was originally kind of like tax day, right? <laughs> like, you're like, oh, how many trees? I have to count them and report. But that it has taken on these more kind of mystical meanings over time. I love that Tubishvat was tax day. What an incredible intention for dreaming the world to come. <laughs> Like, may tax days be turned into <laughs> mystical holidays. <laughs> I love that. The, the proximity to, like, in bulk um, mm -hmm. and that rising of the sap, that really informs the way that I think about Tubishvat now. And in this podcast, a lot of what we talk about are actually cross-cultural connections and the ways that Judaism has intersected with so many other cultures around the globe and created these complex and varied traditions. I'm always in awe when different cultures come up with the same thing without having communicated to each other throughout time and space. It's not always true, but when that happens, you're like, yeah, there's something that makes sense. It's like dancing in a circle around a tree is just something that everyone has done, you know? <laughs> you figured yeah. out that, like, that's the thing to do, you know? <laughs> Good things will happen. That's the only yeah. thing to do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do anything else, really. <laughs> do you want to share some about your Jewish upbringing? Sure, yeah. Jewish identity was definitely a center of life in my family growing up because I was in this sort of conservative Jewish Los Angeles liberal Zionist thing. You know, I went to day schools. I come from a Ashkenazi background and I always had this like Yiddish and neshama, like this soul of like as from a little kid, this Jewish soul. And it was pretty obvious to everyone around. Like I was like drawn towards spiritual and ritual leadership, but in that mainstream way that felt like it was kind of missing some soul. So, you know, I was involved in all that. I was involved in leading services as a nine and 10 year old. And like now when I go to services, I don't even need to crack a C-door because it's like hardwired in there from being little. Mm -hmm. Although I do like to crack them because there's some really cool things in there. But just the, you know, being like involved in the conservative movements, youth programs or summer camps. Like I was on a track. My parents put me on a track. And as I got older and I was developing more identities like punk or queer or anarchist, I was sort of like those politics sort of shifted me away from the religiosity, like, oh no, religion is the opiate of the masses, and like moved more to like activism and organizing. And then when I was in my 20s, I met radical queer Jews who were doing really cool stuff, you know, and then I was like, oh, found my way back. And my soul would like rejoice that I could actually bring in all those parts. And I think that just kept me on the path of like where Judaism now is in my life. I'm very close with my family. And like every Shabbos, I join a Zoom and do Shabbat with my family. Mm. And doing it their way is so lovely just to do it with them. And then I get off the Zoom and then I get really weird with my community here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Can you say a little bit about your community there? Yeah, so I live in intentional community in Middle Tennessee that is really focused on living with land and centering different values besides capitalism, doing mutual aid and showing up for each other. And that's one of the ways that I feel like I do create a world to come is by living in this world. I have many memories of of doing that with you, Nomi, out here when you visited some of the land projects and your own history with this place. And um, we're also a nonprofit, so we're not totally outside of capitalism. But I became the president of the board, but we're not really into presence. So my title is facilitatrix. Yes! <laughs> That's awesome. And so working with the community and facilitating meetings, you know, we're just creating like an, a way for people to get a, like their education paid for through our community and just showing up for each other and finding ways to live as much outside of mainstream as we can while also participating and giving back. It's both. What's the configuration of the community? Is everybody living together? No, it's a little bit spread out, you know, like it's started off as a 
back to the land movement in the late 60s, early 70s. And like, it's just been different configurations over time. And some people who have been here for 50 years are still here. And it's just layered, you know, and it's taken different shapes and forms of people throughout time. And right now it's an entire neighborhood, you know, that spans miles. And like some people are in communes and I live in town right now so that I can also have internet and do my other stuff. It looks like a lot of different things. Like last night, I went to a land party around celebrating the coming of the light and different musicians played and we lit the menorah, you know, just, you know, just different things that people come together and create. But it's big and it's changing. It used to be predominantly white. And there was another period where it was predominantly gay men and cis gay men. And now it's really, there's a lot of AFAB folks. There's a lot of trans folks. There's more people of color. It's still predominantly white, but not in the ways that it was. And so who's here has shifted how we live and what people's needs are. And that's really cool to watch that happen and participate in it. Right now, one of the ways that I'm participating in creating the world to come here is I'm part of a community accountability collective. And we've been working on creating a process for our neighborhood we made a zine and we're all making all decisions collectively and working with transformative justice and abolitionism and it's been so amazing to be a part of that and it's kind of a wonder that we've been here for so long and haven't had that (laughs) but I'm glad we're doing it now how's that going (laughs) oh you know (laughs) slowly but you know but also it's going it's going like the collective is growing and people are engaging and people are pushing back and we're staying with it it's very dynamic and alive even though it feels slow we have a handful of processes going right now and some of them feel stalled out and some of them feel like they're moving and it's I guess it's going at the rate that actual healing can happen you know But it's going and we're doing it so relationally, which I think is so radical to have everything be based on connection instead of kicking people out and disconnecting. It's like, how do I lean in while also saying the behavior that you did broke the process of community and how do you step in to repair it and how do we step in and support you repairing it? You know, while also not losing the people who've been harmed in it. And we're centering the people who've been harmed. So all of the requests are from that point of view. If there's a person who's been harmed who doesn't want a process to happen, then it's not going to happen. And the person can still do their own work and get supported, but it's a different shape. We're very open to making mistakes publicly and figuring out how to do it better and differently too. So we're always learning. And we have like a book group we've been reading that fumbling towards repair book that Shira and Miriam Kaba put together. We meet monthly on the full moon and study that together. And it's super cute, actually, and hard, but good, you know. That's so beautiful. So one of the ways that I am in the world is that I went to school to become a therapist and a counselor. And so I have a private practice where I work with people who have trauma based on oppression. And I've been really moving towards spiritual direction and away from therapy and doing a lot of ritual with people, especially in these COVID times, doing so many grief rituals with people and with nature. I think being a ritual leader and someone who has a background in counseling, it's been such a rich combination in meeting people where they are and finding ways to move where trauma is stuck in the body and in the soul and move it through. I'm remembering even when we were first getting to know each other and trying to figure out how do we even come into space together on the phone? You're like, I mean, if we need to stand up and turn in a circle and then say hello, or you were just like so full of ideas of how to ritualize our time together. And I remember also going and doing this very freeform ritual and in this place that had historical significance for me in Olympia. I think you were one of the first people that I knew who was really down to just go there in our daily normal interactions. Like, yeah, life is a ritual. We can make all of this into a ritual so that we have a little more of a a container for our experiences. I was actually just writing, I'm writing this Jewish magic course 
and I was writing about altars. And when we lived together, you introduced the kitchen altar to me Mm. with putting up so many pictures of goats (laughs) on the wall of the kitchen as the kitchen altar. (laughs) I got to meet all these ancestor goats (laughs) from the home you came from. Yeah, and I still hang out with their descendants. All of those goats have passed, but I hang out with their grandchildren still now. And one of the things that I love about the kind of Jewishness and Judaism that I do is that I'm actually not creating something new. It's really about like going back, finding meaning and embodying the parts that resonate. Someone was saying like what you do kind of new age I was like no it's more old age like when I was in Los Angeles I had the honor of being part of a Hever Kadisha which is a a group of people that work around those who have died and doing the traditions around honoring the deceased and so I learned from a few rabbis how to do it and how to do it traditionally and I think that learning the older ways and then and really leaning into how to do it well and then bringing it to people who, you know, people in tattooed bodies or, you know, mm-hmm. at this point, trans bodies or bodies that traditional Jewish institutions wouldn't consider clean enough to bury. Mm-hmm. And like, those are our people, you know, and so mm-hmm. bringing the old and learning it and then making it fit. It's like how you do with the mikvah, you know, this kind of work that combines healing and old ritual and an eye towards social justice with the decolonial anti-Zionist lens. It's like something that's very motivational for me is that I had ancestors that immigrated to Palestine in the 1850s when they were fleeing oppression where they were in the Pale of Settlement in Eastern Europe. And I deeply feel like it's my calling to undo some of the choices that they made, like taking responsibility for the impacts of them now. And that it's also like having compassion for what they were doing and how they did it. And also taking responsibility, like I said, and using Jewish mysticism and using a connection with the earth and having a relationship with the cycles of the earth and seasons and elements as a way to do that. Thank you for naming that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like having more ways to enter into our Jewishness, especially for white Jews, how to take back that accountability and undermine the victim framing. Yeah, like actually, you know what? Trauma does not have to go on to the next ones. I think one of the ways that I am working with the world to come is with my nibblings, with my siblings kids and trying to not pass on the generational trauma that my generation and previous generations had and figuring out how to create a world with them where they talk to trees and they believe in unseen worlds. One of the communities around here has a 400 plus year old tree on the land. Oh, we must know me. Oh, no. Your internet went went out. out. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll wrap it up, but I really want to hear about this 400-year-old tree. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's like where we are in Middle Tennessee is exactly where the Trail of Tears came through. Where we are in Middle Tennessee is where a lot of chattel slavery practices were happening. And so the tree witnessed all of that. And the tree remains and that like you can feel it and the depth of time and what healing looks like and what growth looks like when I think about that in terms of shvat and being in this this time of year where you're going into hibernation that you're remembering like growing is still happening and it takes time and just thinking about the length of my relationships with you and Nomi that we all grew each other up you know Nomi and I I think it's been closer to 20 and you I think it's been like 15 or something yeah and we're still practicing every day how to heal how to embody how to make mistakes and be humble and also notice when healing's happening and working and all of it yeah I really appreciate that and notice when healing's happening and working (laughs) (laughs) yes yeah let's, let's pay attention to that yeah Thank you so much for talking with us and reconnecting. It's been delightful. I'm so grateful for 
the projects that you do and the projects that you and Nomi are doing together with this marking of time and this expanding and growing of time. It's such a beautiful project and all the ways that it's deepening and expanding is just an honor to be a part of. Dream is alive, dream is alive. Almond meditation for the month of Shvat. You may want to hold an almond in your hand or eat an almond before this meditation to invite in the energy of almond. Take a few breaths in and out, feeling your body like the trunk of a tree Feeling your roots seep down into the soil and your branches reach up through the clouds and the atmosphere to the stars. And feeling your body's capacity to navigate the connection between the two to be a place of experiencing physicality and the sublime and the ineffable. Inviting in almond tree, the first to blossom and last to fruit in Palestine. And the blossoms of this tree, sweet, delicate reminders that we have the patience to show off some of ourself, to share some of our essence and wait for the full fruition to emerge later. So feel into your body what wants to come out just a little bit right now. The sap's just beginning to want to rise. What just is beginning to want to blossom or rise a bit within you? And how can you call on almond to give you patience for the full emergence? the time it'll take to nurture and cultivate the fruit of your offering. Hmm. Taking some more breaths. Thanking Almond for the lessons of delicate hope and emergence and patience. This is This Way to Alam Haba, the part of the podcast where we talk about people and projects who are building the world to come that we are inspired by. And this month we want to shout out our friend, Julianne Gale, who, yeah, Julianne. Julianne, yes, who ran for Washington State Senate this year or last year, depending on what year you're in. <laughs> in 5783, but also in 2022. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, she is a fellow Jew, a Jew of color, uh, community organizer for 20 years who decided to run for state Senate because she saw that to be the way she could most immediately make change around climate chaos because it's such a time-sensitive, immediate issue. And she lives rurally in Washington State, like about a half hour from where we live, and works with Indigenous youth and tribal communities and people who live rurally and is really invested in cultivating a radical, progressive 
rural movement. And when she announced her candidacy, it was so cool because she came I think it was Passover. Pace off, yeah. yeah, at your house and was like, I would like to make an announcement. And I well, was I really... announced her. I was like, Julian's running for state senate. <laughs> and what my memory of it was, was her kind of making a little informal speech, but I was very moved by it because she was saying that in this area, you know, we have rainforests in Washington. Our mm-hmm. forests are so dense. And she was like, acre for acre the forest here has the same global impact as the Amazon rainforest. Obviously it's a lot smaller here, but the impact is both local and it is global. And Mm -hmm. I just really appreciated that she was willing to put herself into, you know, as also a queer person, put herself into this political arena to try to make the kind of changes that she saw needed to happen. And she didn't win, but they still like gave out all these fruit trees and seed packets and created all these alliances and did a lot of generating excitement in community. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking to her after the election was over and she had such a positive attitude about it that she got to have conversations with people she wouldn't ever have been able to talk to, get seats at some tables and she really saw it as a success. I mean, she's got mm-hmm. like 45% of the vote, which for a first so time good. candidate running in a Republican area, that's really amazing. Okay. I mean, I went knocking doors with her one day and the other guy that was with us was a former Republican who had turned Democrat and was supporting her. People embraced her. And then there were other people who were like yelling at us <laughs> Wow! and I was scared, but mm-hmm. she was like, actually, I've had the experience with some of those people. When I start talking to them at first, they're, you know, really negative or telling us to get away. But then actually I've had the occasion of starting to talk to them and that they're really kind mm-hmm. and that they end up saying they're going to vote. So And I think that her approach of really being embedded in and committed to the community, knowing what people are going through and, you know, people that live there love the land and love Mm -hmm. the trees, but also are facing a lot of economic challenges and oppression. And so being able to speak to all of that and finding ways for people to be involved and so much intention just put into every piece of it. Like all of her signs were upcycled. There was no new plastic. And so there was this whole process of painting each sign. And so Lisa and I, my partner and I got to paint like 10 signs and that was a way for us to be involved without being able to go knocking door to door. She's a really good organizer. She also was really great with me, who I'm not super techie, just teaching how to use this app and Mm -hmm. helping elder people figure out how Mm -hmm. to use it. Really helping people find ways to get involved in the way that they could and celebrating that Mm -hmm. along the way. And also being strategic and mindful. It's complicated. It's not like everyone who wants to make a difference should go into electoral politics, but (laughs) I think it's very useful for some people to be doing that. So props to her for choosing that path as well as all the other work that she does. The reason we wanted to include her in this episode is because of her dedication to the trees and to Mm -hmm. the forests and Mm -hmm. a really deep love for old growth forest and for stopping clear cutting and really nurturing the plants and trees of the land here. Yeah. Just a couple announcements before we wrap up this episode. I want to make sure that you know we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash dreaming the world to come. And it helps us make this podcast and you get to be a part of it. We send some extra this and that sometimes full recordings of the interviews this month because we had some technical difficulties with the interview, we, I think, are going to also include our longer conversation that we had about Shabbat because we really got into it. We had a nice, long conversation, and it had to be edited down a lot. So we'll share that with our Patreon folks as well. 
We have the planners on a mega, mega sale, $18 a piece. And also if you are an organization that needs some raffle items or anything like that, we would be really happy to make a donation of mm -hmm. the planner. So please reach out to us about that. We won't be doing the planner again, at least next year. And we did a little short episode about it, which gets really juicy halfway through, I think. <laughs> the beginning part's not too shabby either. No, no, not at all. But then it gets into like, why aren't we doing it again? <laughs> so that's your little teaser. Yeah, it's the one called The Future of Dreaming the World to Come. Get your planners now because you're not going to be able to get one for next year. Revere the trees. Buy a planner so we don't have to recycle them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're brown, like a tree trunk. <laughs> <laughs> and like soil. Sorry. Also, please rate our podcast wherever yeah. you listen. That helps us get into the algorithm and give us a review. Yeah. My roots go down down to the earth my roots go down down to the earth my roots go down down to the earth my roots go down my roots go down down into the earth my roots go down down to the earth my roots go down down into the earth my roots go down my branches reach reach for the stars my branches reach Reach for the stars, my branches reach. Reach for the stars, my branches reach. And my leaves, they turn to the sun. My leaves, they turn, turn to the sun. My leaves, they turn, turn to the sun. And my branches reach. My trunk stays strong, strong in the wind. My trunk stays strong, strong in the wind. My trunk stays strong, strong in the wind. My trunk stays strong. My trunk stays strong, strong in the wind. My branches reach for the stars. My leaves turn to the sun and my roots go down. <laughs>